Oh, brothers and sisters, this is my travel perspective, part three. That's where it's your sting. Uh, and the overall verse that we're going to look at that surrounds the message is Proverbs fourteen twelve. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And uh, in the beginning, God created us and breathed into our lungs. And we were in harmony with him. And uh, he put many fruit tree of life in the garden and then the tree of knowledge of good of evil which he told us not to eat of and then uh, the serpent who is the enemy Satan he always brings out the desires of death within us and he came and tempted Eve and said God didn't say that and he just doesn't want you to be like him and uh, she took of it and then we came with the mind where we desired to choose to define life ourselves and desire to define good and evil for ourselves because of this because our mind was tainted without God our mind cannot truly understand. And God did leave. We were separated in him because there was so much death in us from this. Uh, what is good and evil in reality is anything that reflects and is in harmony with God. And we may attempt to reach Eden. We might have this idea of God eventually and seek him because there's evidence of him everywhere uh, and we have this idea of a creator but our minds are darkened and confused and we start to create what we think God is like and that's in Romans 1 it talks about that and we would settle with that to reach Eden and I want to see Eden as in the same way heaven I do this this and that you know and it's my efforts. Um, and the light left us. And we became separated from life itself. Which is God. And we live this way. Defiling and destroying ourselves. And it broke God's heart. And prior to that. Uh, God. You know. Death entered to the world when we did this. And he's, when he said you surely will die. There was spiritual death. Death is separation from God. And then there's physical death as a result, which first entered into the world by our choice. He gave us that choice because we, as parents, I mean, did you, do you, would you want a robot child that can't really think for itself and he just automatically moves and, and it doesn't really seem like life. It doesn't seem like it's very precious. But a precious moment is them to live good and live well under your supervision and, and to, love, to, to choose you over these things of this world that really hurt them. And uh, just feeling that is incredible. And, do you know, so... <coughs> He did not desire to watch us live for eternity in this way with us defiling ourselves and destroying ourselves and hurting one another. Um, and he lowered the amount of debt time we have on earth. And we walked trying to fill the dark void in us with things that keep us in death. We start to fill this dark void. We we start to decide <coughs> what is life, what is death, what is good, um, and the world will promote all this stuff. That that because there's a day, as scriptures say, that good is evil and evil is good, and uh, the good is what is of God is kind of like you don't want to push that on somebody. You. you 
you can't talk about that so much. It might offend somebody or they might be uncomfortable with it. Um, but there's other things that we can constantly talk about that's very uncomfortable and, and people seem fine with it. Because we speak death. There's a way that seems right to a man. Anyway, to continue with that, um, to keep us in death. And then we have this pursuit. Uh, we have this mindset. We only live once. We don't live forever. I just want to live how I eat, drink, and be merry. Live how I want and uh, uh, define what's happiness for me. Uh, fill myself. Try to find what fills this dark void. What, what, uh, and death really can control us in reality. And we don't understand that. But it takes a bind of us. Either the fear of it. Or the, well it's there so I might enjoy life until I croak. And it just controls us in such a way. <coughs> and, uh... Hebrews. <coughs> it says, uh, 2.14, it says, Because God's children are human being made flesh and blood. The Son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human being could he die, and only by dying could he break the power of the devil, who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all who lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. So, yeah, we need to understand that. Um... Satan has always brought death into the world. And he is the one who has the power over it. We want to blame God. But do you think he wants to watch us defile ourselves? And I'm talking about spiritual death. We uh, say, well, why does God let this happen? Why does he let that kind of thing happen? But what he's doing, he's trying to open people's eyes. And... Uh, have them see he's trying to bring life into others it's Satan who's trying to bring death Ephesians 2 <coughs> it says once you were dead because of your disobedience and many sins you used to live in sin just like the rest of the world obeying the devil the commander of the powers in the unseen world. He is the spirit at work in the hearts of those who refuse to obey God. All of us used to live that way, following the passionate desires and inclinations of our sinful nature. By our very nature, we were subject to God's anger, just like everyone else. But God is so rich in mercy, and He loved us so much that even though we were dead because of our sins... He gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you have been saved. So it is, again, the devil who is bringing all this death. The enemy is not flesh and blood. It's not all these people acting this way. They haven't breathed in life. They are being tormented and tortured and, and going through pain and affected. You see if someone acts a certain way and you see it, you fill yourself with hate, right? And what happens? That, become, that brings out so many. You start drinking and doing other things to fill it. You're trying to fill that void. And that brings more death and destruction. And it just becomes a chain reaction throughout many people. We act this way, and they act this way, and they act this way, and they act this way. And it's just a chain of death. And Satan, that is his plan. 
he wants to show us and promote that. Why? Because he doesn't want us to have life. He's come to kill, steal, and destroy. And he's going to do whatever it takes to do that. He does not want us to open our eyes to God. He wants to pull us into the grave and into internal damnation and suffering. So he will fill us with death as sin. Defining what's good in our eyes, ways that seem right to a man. But he's the one promoting it. <coughs> and when we feel unsatisfied and empty and realize that this is not what we need to feel satisfied, we start to feel depressed and we start to want to just die. And when we get to that point, Unless we start to open our eyes to God, he gets us in the grave and then there's no hope. And that's his plan. He will continuously throw death at us to keep us from coming to life. But then we all live that way. It's his influence. The enemy's not flesh and blood. I said that again. But God... Even though we were dead in sin, he is pursuing us and bringing his life to bring us to life. But then we have death controlling us. Um, but we overcome by the power of the blood of Christ and the word of our testimony. And that we do not love our lives, but we give our lives to Christ like he gave our lives to his life for us. So that death no longer controls us and we do not shrink back to save our life. But we continuously march forward like soldiers and bring life into others. <coughs> okay. So we're going back. So then we're talking about the second thing. So we talked about how God breathed in, in the beginning, into our lungs and brought us life. But when we chose to take of the tree of knowledge, death entered into us. We became separated from him. And we had that empty voice. Or void. But. The second thing. That it says. That he breathed out. <coughs> is in 2 Timothy 3.16. Says. God. Breathed out. Or all scripture. Is breathed out by God. For correction, reproof, and discipline. So as we. Start to have start to read the word relying on the word we'll get more into that and we breathe in everything that he spoke out that is defines him and shows his heart and who he is and what's not of him we breathe it in into our lungs and the life enters into us God is breathing back into us through what he said what's of him and how he moves and as it enters into us, the death will start coming out of us. But we must let it root deep into our hearts. Grow deep into our hearts, rooted, and we'll have life. Uh, <coughs> but it's once it becomes a sweet fragrance. When Christ, you know, when Christ truly moves into your heart, Second Corinthians two, it says that thank God He has made us His captives and continues to lead us along in Christ's triumphal procession. <coughs> now He uses us to spread the knowledge of Christ everywhere like a sweet perfume. 
Our lives are a Christ-like fragrance rising up to God. But this fragrance is perceived differently by those who are being saved and by those who are perishing. To those who are perishing, we are a dreadful smell of death and doom. But to those who are being saved, we are a life-giving perfume. So, if it continues and we hear this, and it's like death and doom breathing into us. Like we're having toxin in us. It's not the time to speak to those people. They are still in death. Christ is not, they're not waking up. They're not, they're not there. But as, as it becomes a sweet perfume to us and, and you could tell Christ is starting to wake that person up and their blindness is starting to come alive. You breathe it in, that sweet perfume goes into their lungs and, and you start to have life but you be renewed every day and draw near to God daily and do this process and, and this will lead us to life. <coughs> and he's speaking both to us directly and he will speak to us through other people. He'll use both because it is Christ, no longer I who live but Christ in me. So he will move, he, he will make his appeal through me. And whether it becomes a sweet perfume to y'all or if it's death or doom. You know, you know Christ is working in you. And that, that constant bringing that fragrance in you, that's how you're going to let the death in. You're going to see things. Um, Colossians 3. So you start to get into this mindset and you set, you are raised to new life with Christ. And then you set your sights on the realities of heaven, <coughs> where Christ sits in a place of honor at God's right hand. Think about the things of heaven, not the things of earth. For you died to this life, and your real life is hidden with Christ and God. So we have died to this life now. We have died on the cross with Christ. It's a picture of baptism. We have died to ourselves. We are drowning out our old self. And we are raising with him, putting our passions and desires of our sinful nature on the cross and leaving it there and coming into new life. But we have to continuously breathe in the scripture that is for reproof correction discipline it will knock out our old way of thinking and that's what needs to happen you have to destroy your human perspective because he is renewing our mind daily and we have to let God change the way we think so by doing that we think about the things of heaven not the things of earth for you died to this life and your real life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is your life, so he becomes life, like we've been talking about. Satan brings death, Christ brings life. Is revealed to the whole world, you will share in his glory. <coughs> so put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. Put to death. Christ can do this in us. Put to death. The death by bringing in the life. I have nothing to do with sexual morality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. Don't be greedy, <coughs> for a greedy person is an idolater, worshiping the things of this world. Because of these sins, the anger of God is coming. You used to do these things, but your life was still part of the world. You say it's the ruler, and he's the ruler of death. But God has destroyed his power over death. But once we come into him, further into Christ, breathing in life back into us, the death starts to die. But now is the time to get rid of anger, rage, malicious behavior, slander, and dirty language. Don't 
lie to each other. For you have stripped off your old sinful nature <coughs> and all its wicked deeds. Put on your new nature and be renewed as you learn to know your creator and become like him. That's our goal. Back in harmony. Becoming like him. Um, in all these things, we're going to get further into that later. We're going to talk about how the tongue brings death, but that's going to be a little while. Um, <coughs> so, now we're talking about that, but as we read the scripture and, and let it breathe into us, to bring his life, we have to understand this one thing. In the beginning, tree of life, tree of knowledge of good and evil. We can read and feed on scripture with the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Our, in our human perspective, we're putting our mind into it and trying to understand. We can say, well, I read it four or five times. You know, it really doesn't, you know, you can't tell me not. But the thing is, with our human mind using, uh, well, feeding on the tree of knowledge. While well, reading scripture, we're still going to be in death. This is empty pages. Well, you're relying on your human mind. You won't have understanding. Because, as it says in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 2, it says we can evaluate all things because we have the mind of Christ. Those who have the mind of Christ can understand it. But if you don't have the mind of Christ, if you're not renewed and relying on the Spirit, you won't understand any of this. So, uh, and now we're going to go to the tree of life. So the tree of life, um, well, what does Jesus say? He says, I am the vine, you are the branch. Remain in me and I remain in you. Or abide in me and I abide in you. So if we are remaining in Christ, look, I am the vine, you are a branch. That's a picture of a tree Jesus' life itself tree of life so if we are remaining with the tree of life Christ and we are feeding on scripture through relying and remaining in him he will show us understanding and by doing that process well, we had that sweet fragrance and that breath enter into us and destroy the death in us. But, right? Amen. So, uh, yeah, I want to connect to this a little bit. But I'm not going to go too deep into it. But, uh, I want to go into a, or no, first before I talk about that, the power over death. I want to talk about that a little longer. Jesus, so we become obedient to the things he's, we, uh, Jesus became obedient to the things he suffered. And in the same way, likewise, for us, um, we must live like Christ. Uh, we become like Him, it says. So, uh, you think about what He was doing on the cross. Or no, in, the, in Gethsemane. He was very distressed and overpowered. And just... <coughs> <clears throat> he got to the point where he's like, um, take this cup away from me. 
He, he was just crying out to God. He, it, it was just so much on him. He didn't know if he could go through with it. But because of his love for us and, and the power of God in him, he said, but my, not my will be done. Yours wills be done. So his, his, his death, it didn't bind him. But he knew it needed to be used to bring people to God and to glorify him. Um, and so often we say, take this cup away from me. But with our new perspective, we're going to start saying, not my will be done, your will will be done. Because we're going to realize what we suffer might bring people to God. And I'm going to talk about that with 2 Corinthians 4. Oh, before I go into that, 1 Peter 4. 1 Peter 4 shares... So then, since Christ suffered physical pain, you must arm yourselves with the same attitude he had, and be ready to suffer too. For if you have suffered physically for Christ, you have finished with sin. <coughs> you won't spend the rest of your lives chasing your own desires, but you will be anxious to do the will of God. So now we start to get this mindset you know, having the same attitude and arming myself with that, that I might go through these things and I could either let death destroy me and pull me down through it and I curl into a ball or I can arm myself with, am I going to look further? What is this going to do for people? How is this going to glorify God? And I had that mindset, willing to give myself and suffer even in pain and looking for a proper perspective to uh, to walk through it that will glorify God. And when we start to grow into that mindset instead of letting death hold us down and affect us, you know, it becomes doing the will of God becomes an anchor. And we're not focused on chasing our own desires and all this death because we're going to die anyway but it actually helps us I mean we're willing to give our lives for others willingly and that willingness will overpower the sin in us so Second Peter or Second Corinthians <coughs> 4 so we're in this process, right? <coughs> so now, we have this light shining in our hearts, but we ourselves are like fragile clay jars containing this great treasure. This makes it clear that our great power is from God and not ourselves. That we work, God works best in our weaknesses. When I am weak, He is strong. And we have the mindset. I mean, you can have simple things that you can handle in your weakness, but then you can go into supernatural areas and really move through it um, by relying on the power of God. And actually, something that bind me that I realized that I was doing yesterday, I was trying to, I had this cough, it was worse then, but it had been, and I was trying to ask other people to pray and um, to, to help strengthen me to get through this. And then not even 10 minutes later, God was like, no. I said, never mind to them. You call upon me. You rely on the power in you. And trust me to get through you in your weakness to get through it. And that's what he wants us to do. He wants us to learn 
to cling on to him we call upon him not other people the more we practice this the more we will draw nearer to him and trust him more because we are learning to use the power he has given us to call upon his name directly to cast out these things that are overpowering us and when we can do that we bring glory relying on other people constantly and just you know praying in such a way but not activating this power and these gifts in within us it, it's not going to bring out the overwhelming power of God in us <coughs> so I'm going to continue so back in Corinthians we are pressed on every side by troubles but we are not crushed we are perplexed but not driven to despair we are hunted down but never abandoned by God we get knocked down but we are not destroyed through suffering our bodies continue to share in the death of Jesus so that the life of Jesus may also be seen in our bodies yes we live under constant danger of death because we serve Jesus so that the life of Jesus will be evident in our dying bodies so we live in the face of death but this has resulted in eternal life for you. Look at that promise. It says we're going to face these things and face troubles. But if we cling on to Christ and rely on him. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 1. He says that he was in the province of Asia. And he was expected to die. But he relied to learn to rely on God and not himself. We learn to rely on life on God to overcome this instead of shrinking back out of the fear of death we move forward and face these things and fight through these things and people will see Christ in us how are you walking through that it is the power of God look at look at it how many people do you think face death in the Bible and brought glory, God glory to it. They willingly walked, you know, even in the burnings of Nero. And they faced that. They faced many things because they knew it would be in Christ. Paul, he says, live your life worthy of your calling while he was in prison. He, then she knew being there helped encourage others because he would speak and and was put, put in this place of darkness their prisons would have been way worse than ours i mean they actually got beaten and whipped so just imagine that but he did it for us christ died for us we went through all this for us and we go through this for others having this willingness to face anything to help bring the gospel <coughs> and uh in that constant danger of death because we serve Jesus. We're going to face these things because we serve Jesus. And God, we have this perspective. Either we shrink back because we love our life too much, or we will go forward and glorify God. Look, look how he's getting me through this. I am weak. He is making me strong. It is him in me. Hallelujah. Right. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to talk about Jesus on the boat. And this is going to get into the church. Uh, and today, it says the, po or the apostles were in a boat, right? And caught in the middle of a storm. And Jesus was asleep in the boat. And they were afraid of the storm and everything else and they woke him up and said how can you sleep at a time like this and Jesus calmed the storm with the wave of his hand and told them why do you have such little faith why do you have such little faith how many times did Jesus say that to people what do we do well they're not there in their walk we don't warn them we keep them in this little bubble because we don't want to share with them or or offend their faith they're weaker in faith we don't want to say anything to them but 
though we can accept where they're at in their walk, we need to warn them so they can help grow. Because that bind and not tapping into the power of God to overcome it is going to keep us in this place uh, of, of lack of growth. <coughs> so, and they had Christ on the outside. And now we have Christ living inside of us. So what it really is our excuse. I mean, they were afraid of the storm and Jesus was in the boat. But that was outside of them. They didn't have that like full like Jesus in you faith power of God in them yet. They had some authority. But he lives in us. So what is our excuse? We need to tap into the power. We, Timothy says... They, they they have a form of godliness, or they, they um, claim to be religious, but they refuse the power that makes them godly. Christ has this in us and for us to overcome and power these things that will bring glory to Him. Anyways, and we're going to get further than that. They had Christ, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. In Timothy, it says, we have not been given a spirit of fear. Not been given a spirit of fear. So we need to grow out of that because it's not a spirit in us. It says, we, we talked about that. The flesh and the spirit, they're in constant war with one another. Galatians 5, right? Constant battle. So, if you're relying on the flesh, you're going to be fearful. you get into the spirit and rely on him you will not have a spirit of fear but a power love self-control when you are fearful and in death and anxious about what might happen it affects everything around you it affects your judgment your thoughts your conscience and that affects how you treat others because you're bound up. You're not focused on Christ and trusting in Him. Anyways, so back to the storm. <coughs> <coughs> they woke up Jesus during the storm. Rather, you know, we could wake up Jesus. Well, why haven't we? Because we go to human ideas and science. We rely on these things rather than going into the power and the gifts that he brought out throughout the body. Uh, we don't really grow into those things enough. Rather, we just rely on the things that humans created. We call it God. Of God, we we can, and it, it has its place for it. But He also wants us to grow uh, and show power over these things, and show that He's God and has control. Amen. All right. Um, and while we do this, well, Jesus is still asleep in the boat. He's resting until we call upon Him. And here's the thing. <laughs> Revelation, it shares that uh, you can be a church and be dead. Even if you seem alive. And we, and I'm not, and that means asleep and we need to be woken up. Someone needs, we need to wake up all those powers and calling upon the Lord and trusting in Him. Rather than just go into these ways of the world. And Christ, if we, if we grow into that, we can instantly take the keys of the kingdom he's given us and call upon him to calm this storm. <coughs> but if we're not relying on him, 
and we're reading the word with the, with the tree of knowledge I mean he's going to stay asleep he's waiting for us to want to rely on him rather than the tree of knowledge tree of life or tree of knowledge because we are the body of Christ he has chosen to move through us not relying on the church that is a motivational speaker or band with a band but rather because the world does that that's pretty dead one that's moving together like a living organism we have our body our arms our legs our face our nose our ears I mean we're all moving together forward without fear in harmony and then that power in us as we work together and be his body because we are the body of Christ we can tell that storm to stop and he will hear and answer but we keep people weak and insecure and keep them in the fear of death around them just like we stopped calling out sin and keep people spiritually dead and the world is wondering why God isn't healing our land but we let fear and division keep Christ resting yeah alright <coughs> so So now, Proverbs 18.20. Now we're going to talk about the tongue. It says in Proverbs 18.20, The tongue can bring life or death. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences. So, now it's how we speak unto others. If we keep speaking death and sin and allowance of it, and not calling it out, we're keeping people in death. If we speak life in Christ and His ways onto people and plant that seed, we're planting life. Uh, in James, it says that the tongue is from the fires of hell itself. It, you know, it's, it's the smallest thing in the body, but it can set forests on fire. The fires of hell itself <coughs> and we can speak life and the consequence will bring people to glorify God and bring them into life and the more we speak life the more death loses its power over this world because the more we speak death around people and, and talk about them and judge them and treat them bad, uh, they're going to, you know, feel unworthy themselves and get to that point where they just want to fill themselves with death. And, you know, there is a consequence. We will be consequence. How many people are we leading to death, either both by our, what we preach, both by how we treat them, by the allowance of the things that we know keeps us separated from God. <laughs> and life. How are we speaking life into others? And how is that reacting onto? How is that making a chain reaction? I want to talk about something. Uh, so, I had a brother who took his life. And uh, I wasn't in a place of Christ at that time. I had religion, but I didn't have Jesus. And uh, me and my wife constantly spoke death unto one another. And 
you know, onto him, and we didn't have any understandings of where he's come from and his actions, even if we knew he had the idea to do this. And we weren't filled. But I know that if we spoke life and our mindset focused on life, our mind was focused on life and speaking it, speaking of Christ, the good things, what things lead to death, and, and just calling upon that. It would have made a huge impact into his life. But instead, we just see the death without understanding of who's causing the death, and then we're not speaking upon the death. When Jesus he just focused on helping them and not really his own problems he kept that mindset not my will be done but your will be done and with that mindset and with that purpose of wanting life for others the abundant life which is through him he did whatever it took even if it took him 40 lashes. By his wounds we were healed. <coughs> By his wounds we were healed. And we were made whole. <coughs> and we can face that for others. And we can help others be whole. And that effect. And if we constantly speak that life unto others. And I can't hold that you know against myself that I wasn't woken up at that time I did for a little bit but I have to keep my eyes on the cross and and as Paul says look at the goal ahead of me and keep running the race with endurance focusing on the heavenly prize and I have to learn from that death that physical death I have to learn from it and use it as life to help others to understand the importance of speaking life unto others and that I don't sweat that at all we need to speak, stop speaking death unto others and people will be healed we gotta stop speaking hate we gotta stop the language we gotta stop all of it and we just have to speak life and hope. And there will be freedom. And we don't have to, if we continue to hit this path, it will trickle across. We no longer have to, like, be so dreaded by all the death and, and, and all the things that are tearing us apart that people are doing. Because we are doing whatever we t it takes to spread Christ and the love and the transformation of hearts and if we focus on that transformation of hearts and continue it and that's focusing and we keep focusing on that life that life that life that life that life and it's just all we're thinking about speaking life onto others life will spread and the death will decrease both sin sin specifically because what was Jesus' focus, even with Lazarus? It was this. People were worried about the physical death. I'm going to talk about Peter first. He said, Jesus was talking about his death, that it must happen. And, and Jesus said, and, and Peter rebuked him. And Jesus said, you are thinking from a human point of view. Step aside from me, Satan. And then we go to the second thing. Where Jesus knew he was sick, Lazarus, <coughs> four days prior. And then he waited four days and he said that Lazarus was asleep without anybody saying anything. And he went there and he knew what he had to do. It was part of God's glory and it was meant to happen that way <coughs> with the right mindset. And everybody was like upset with him for not showing up. If he showed up, my brother would be alive, right? 
And Jesus' only focus was this. I am the resurrection and the life. If anyone is in me, they live even if they die. That's the focus point on this message. Even if they die, they will live. We point to life, Christ himself. And we become in him. And we will live. Life is about being in harmony with our creator. Life is having him inside of us. And living through him inside of us. Life is about Jesus Christ. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Amen. Okay. So if we continue to keep that mindset. And realize Jesus' focus is to bring people unto him. True life. Whether they live or die. We don't have to let the physical death. It's not an issue. And we're going to talk about that now. So. 1 Corinthians 15. It's part of the process. <coughs> Such a beautiful thing. So it talks about. How, hold on. Hmm. Okay. Sorry, uh, so verse 35, it says, But someone may ask, how will the dead be raised? What kind of bodies will we have? What a foolish question, it says. When you put a seed into the ground, it doesn't grow into a plant unless it dies first. <coughs> first, we have, our physical body has to die first. And then it's a seed that grows. the seed that grows that's part of that to get our glorified body we have to be a, become like a seed and be put in the ground and what you put in the ground is not the plant that will grow but only a bare seed of wheat or whatever you are planting <coughs> <laughs> then God gives it the new body he wants it to have. A different plant grows from each kind of seed. Similarly, there are different kinds of flesh. One kind for humans, another kind, another for animals, another for birds, and another for fish. There are also bodies in the heavens and bodies on earth. The glory of the heavenly bodies is different from the glory of the earthly bodies. The sun has one kind of glory, well, the moon and stars each have another kind. <coughs> and even the stars differ from each other in their glory. It is the same way with the resurrection of the dead. Our earthly bodies are planted in the ground when we die. But they will be raised to live forever. We have to die to live forever. Our physical bodies. But in Christ we live forever. But if we don't have Christ, if we don't speak life, if we just speak death, we will stay in death. An internal separation. And we have that choice. Life or death. <coughs> Our bodies are buried in brokenness. But they will be raised in glory. They are buried in weakness. But they will be raised in strength. They are buried as natural human bodies. But they will be raised as spiritual bodies. For just as there are natural bodies. There are spiritual bodies. So we're going to go down. <coughs> but let me reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment, in the blink of an eye, when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will be also 
transformed. For our dying bodies must be transformed into bodies that will never die. Our mortal bodies must be transformed into immortal bodies. Then when our bo dying bodies have been transformed into bodies that will never die, this scripture will be fulfilled. Death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your sting? O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? For sin is the sting that results in death. And the law gives sin its power. But thank God, he gives us victory over sin and death through our Lord Jesus Christ. So my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord. For you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. And I'm going to close with this verse right here. Oh man, that is amazing word right there. Hold on to that. Never forget that. Keep your eyes on the new glorified bodies, not these dying ones. Don't focus on the flesh. We all die. Don't focus on the flesh. Be ready and anticipating to be that plant, that seed put in the ground so we can have that glorified body. Focus on that. And focus on that for others. But we have to focus on getting the death out of them. So they can have life forever. <coughs> Philippians. For I fully... Philippians 1, 20. For I fully expect and hope that I will never be ashamed. But that I will continue to be bold for Christ. As I have been in the past. And I trust that my life will bring honor to Christ, whether I live or die. For to me, living means living for Christ, and dying is even better. For if I live, I can do more fruitful work for Christ. So I really don't know which is better. I am torn between two desires. I long to go and be with Christ, which would be far better for me. But for your sakes, it is better that I continue to live. Knowing this, I am convinced that I will remain alive so I can continue to help all of you grow and experience the joy of your faith. And when I come to you again, you will have even more reason to take pride in Christ Jesus because what he is doing through me. Look at that. That is incredible. Actually... When my brother passed, this is the verse that spoke to me because I was seeing nothing but death surrounding him at the end in his casket. And and uh, this really spoke to me. It's like, what am I living for? What's What am I going to be remembered by? You know, everything I did just brought death and decay to myself and to others. And I was just looking about that. And then I just filled myself. With with life, I I just I breathed it in. I got that his lung, his breath into my lungs. <coughs> but now we can have the same mindset. This is for to me, but as Paul saying, but we can all have this mind and this perspective, and we can pursue it. Where. We have this hope for ourselves and for others, and we can share this with others, that we live for Christ, and we die for Christ, and that it's torn, which one's better? I mean, we want to be with Christ, and we can have that focus, I want to be with Christ, but we have that focus, I want you to be with Christ. Or we live here to continue to speak that life and, and put fruit into others and show them the examples of love, joy, patience, peace, gentleness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. We speak that and we continue to live. But the implications we see here also is Christ 
is going to keep us here to do his work and put fruit into others. All things are unto his glory. He has his timing for all people. And he's going to use us. And we will continue to live as long as Christ has us to live. And we will continue to bear fruit into one another as long as Christ has chosen us to bear fruit in one another. Because, as it says in Corinthians, we no longer belong to ourselves. We are bought with a high price. So we can put our whole life and trust into His hands. And we, as we do this, we could say, and, and be so bound, it was like, well, what if that person's not going to, to heaven? What if he's not going to live forever? Speak life. And if it's Christ in you and he bought you with a high price and he's speaking that life, you just trust that that is going to reach into his heart. And you just focus on that. Don't worry about their, their end. Just speak life. Because if you worry about that end and where someone might be, it's going to destroy you. You just focus and use it and just keep moving and sharing and being used. And trust God's moving in you. He knows what he's doing. If he's going to have that person speak and they're receiving it. And if it's not a fragrance of death and doom, I mean, just rejoice. Just rejoice all we need to do okay so he's gonna keep us since he owns us he's gonna keep us on this earth as long as he needs to and that last dying breath he's gonna use it as an impact to glorify himself if we keep that mindset and we are willing to be used instead of complain we are not we we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the power of our testimony and we did not love our lives so much that we shrink back from death but because we know we're already dead to this life and we are in Christ that uh we trust he's going to use that and, and we're going to cling to him to use that and glorify him in our dying bodies. We don't have to let death control us and grip us. Where is it, Sting? We're going to have glorified bodies once we become that seed in the ground. But until then, to live is Christ. And then once we reach death, that's gained because we can be with him. But our mindset until then... Let's produce fruit. Let's speak life and destroy the death in ourselves and in others. And be filled, like we talked about in Ezekiel 3.10. Let his words grow deep into us and then speak unto others. Don't do that any other way. Otherwise, you might lead others to death. And you might misunderstand the situation. And make, feel pe make people feel worse about themselves. Rather than leading them into the truth. There's hope. But we speak life to reach it. And life is Christ. Let us pray. Jesus, we just thank you for all that you have done. Just the hearts you have given those pursuing you. We just ask that we constantly stand grounded in your word and let your words grow deep, that we do not build our life on sand, that it wrecks, but <coughs> we look for the solid foundation to be built upon. <coughs> and we just pray that this message will just grow and touch others and give them a full understanding to overcome death. And, and destruction and that they would have a new perspective 
and they can just live life to the fullest abundant life for you for to live is you and to die is to be with you and both is just remarkable and we just uh, thank you for all your blessings and the opportunity to be used by you we just ask if anything of this is not of you forgive me but what is just let it overpower one's heart in Jesus' name we pray, amen.